Hi, everybody. So it's a great crowd. So how many of you heard about the discovery of the Higgs boson, or the God particle, last uh, summer? <laughs> excellent, excellent. So that's fantastic news, but you have to be careful about the language you use if you go to tell <laughs> your friend. If you tell a scientist that uh, they discovered the God particle, you might get slapped. Because as you might expect, scientists don't really like using a term like God particle for describing something, uh, uh, something like that. But it has definitely been a, a, a very important thing. Uh, the journal Science called it uh, the, the breakthrough of the year, uh, which was, which was you know, uh, very, you know, made my parents proud, and I was very excited, and et cetera. And now I can do something really cool like this. Watch this. Uh, what is the mass of the Higgs boson? I, get, I don't have to turn off my phone. So it's going to check. We'll see. It's, let me think about that. There we go. Siri knew. OK, so we know the mass of the Higgs boson, and uh, so you don't have to remember it anymore. So it's, it's, been, it's somehow captured public's imagination. I think that's just fantastic. Um, but it has been difficult to try to explain to the public what this is and why it's important. And uh, you know, I have some colleagues that have lamented about, uh, about this and compared it to astronomy and said astronomers have it so easy. They just put up a picture of the stars and things like that. And yeah, they're talking about dark matter, but you know, really, it just speaks for itself. You have these beautiful images. And in particle physics, it's a little bit more difficult. And uh, the, the person went on to say that, you know, in some sense, everyone is an amateur astronomer, but nobody is an amateur, amateur particle physicist. So, um, that sounds right, but I also, you know, my friend and I kind of rejected that idea because just like people have been looking into, the spa into space forever, wondering about what else is out there, people have also, you know, taken an inward glance to try to ask the question of what is everything made out of? That's a classic question that's been there forever, some part of innate human curiosity. So I want to try and take a voyage, an inward voyage, towards the Higgs boson, and the guiding principle is going to be that of symmetry. So I started with just a picture of a snowflake, beautiful six-fold symmetry. I think everyone can look at that and, and agree that that's beautiful. And why do we think it's beautiful? Maybe it's because symmetry is fairly rare in nature, and you know, we don't see things that look like that very often. Um, however, if you look closer, like here, here's a picture of, this is pollen uh, taken with an electron microscope. I was just amazed when I saw this picture that nature can be so symmetrical in this way. You know, the symmetry start to be enhanced as you go into these smaller and smaller scales. And by the time you get to the atom, uh, symmetry, instead of being the exception, is really the rule. So maybe this is your picture of what an atom looks like with a nucleus, with uh, electrons orbiting around it. And it's a pretty good picture, but there are some deficiencies with that picture. And, uh, and there were physicists around the turn of the 20th century that came up with a new way of thinking about the atom that involves something called quantum mechanics. Okay. And this was a radical departure in our understanding of reality. And it had a, you know, a, it was really profound change. Um, and in terms of the atom, instead of this idea of an electron orbiting around, it got changed with this probabilistic cloud. The electron is some bizarre quantum mechanical thing. But what I want to focus on here is that these clouds are perfectly symmetric. They're not approximately symmetric. They are perfectly symmetric. And somehow the language of mathematics reveals itself to be unreasonably effective in describing the natural world when you get to these small scales. So math is really our guide, and the symmetries are not just aesthetic, they are really you know, how it works. Now, quantum mechanics was great and led to a lot of you know, philosophical debate, but it also gave us some pretty cool gadgets. It gave, you know, in this kind of research, we got x-rays, then we got uh, transistors, which is you know, responsible for this computer and your smartphone and all of these things. Uh, we got uh, uh, the laser, yeah, that's pretty useful, fundamentally based on quantum mechanics, electron microscopes, MRIs, PET scans. So while I want to focus on the fundamental science, I don't want you to forget about the fact that there have been a lot of practical applications, unanticipated practical applications from this type of curiosity-driven research. Okay, so let's get back to symmetry. This is Emmy Noether. She is a, you know, one of the best uh, mathematicians of all time, and she probably you know, said the most important thing tying symmetry to the natural world. And it was this theorem that she had that said whenever you have a symmetry, you should have a corresponding conservation law. Okay, so for instance, the idea that the laws of physics over here are fundamentally the same as over here, that there's a translational symmetry, implies that momentum is conserved. The idea that the laws of physics right now are fundamentally the same as they were last week implies that energy is conserved, that it's neither created nor destroyed, it just changes forms. That's a very deep connection, and, uh, and, and it's been a driving principle for physics uh, ever since. 
Now Einstein, when he came up with his theory of relativity, it added one more symmetry to the story, not just translations and rotations and things. Now there's a symmetry that relates space and time. And Paul Dirac realized that when you put that together with quantum mechanics, it implied antimatter, that there should be antiparticles floating around. And that was a very bold claim because no one had ever seen anything like antimatter before. But just a year later, that was confirmed in experiments, and you know, he was right, and there is antimatter out there. Now you can take the same idea and do it one more time. It turns out that space and time can have exactly one more symmetry, we call it supersymmetry, and if it's real, if that's how the universe works, there should be a new doubling of particles. So from matter to antimatter, and now a new doubling that we call sparticles for supersymmetric particles. So we have not seen these. We have been looking for them. Don't worry, that's, you know, we are not uh, uh, just uh, idle uh, time. We, we, are, we are, uh, you know, have a search to find these particles, but we have not seen them. And this is the one of the things that uh, is on the table. But uh, th there's another place where symmetry comes into play, and that has to do with the fundamental forces. So there are four fundamental forces of nature. There's gravity, which is the, probably the most familiar. There's the electromagnetic interaction, which is you know when you play with magnets and things, it's also why your cell phone works and et cetera. Um, it turns out that you can describe and explain uh, that force by saying that at every point in space, there's a new internal type of symmetry. And in the case of electricity and magnetism, that symmetry is a perfect circle. The other forces also have some other kind of symmetry associated to them. And so really, symmetry is you know, the driving principle. But there is a problem. This theory that we've constructed, which is you know, based on symmetry, that's been incredibly successful, I would argue the most successful science theory that we've ever had, has a problem, and that is that it only works, all the equations only work, if all the particles are massless. And we know that the particles are not massless, they have mass. And somehow it's this mass that breaks the symmetry and makes everything go awry. And this is just not, you know, we just can't stand uh, uh, with this kind of situation, we need to resolve this problem. So Peter Higgs and some others in 1964 proposed a solution to this problem. And this idea restored the symmetry back to the theory and uh, it also gave a, a, an explanation, a mechanism to describe where the masses of the fundamental particles come from. So I'm gonna try to give you a, a, a brief guide to this, uh, this idea. Okay, so this is a cartoon that was made by George Cham and a friend of mine, Daniel Whiteson. And uh, I think it's one of the best explanations we have. So you, the theory starts with this. So first you have to imagine the universe is permeated with some field, okay? This word is maybe not you know, familiar, but if you've ever played with magnets, you know, they, there's, they're pushing on each other and there's some invisible force field between them. So it's just something everywhere in space that's there, okay? So that's this field. And it turns, and then the, the next part of the idea is that every particle uh, as it's moving around, you know, doing its business, it interacts with this field. And some particles interact very strongly, and they have a large mass. And other kinds of particles barely interact at all, and they have a very small mass. So it's pretty simple at that stage. Uh, but if you, you know, think about it carefully, all you've done is turn one problem into another. You know, the question of why particles have different masses into why do they interact more or less strongly with this Higgs field. So at that level, you haven't really solved the problem, but you did uh, restore the symmetry to these theories, and it comes with a prediction that there should be a new particle called the Higgs boson. And it, it, the, the Higgs boson is the manifestation of this field, and if we see it, that's how we confirm that the theory is true. Okay, so how do you go looking for a Higgs boson? You do not look under your pillow. They are not there. I've looked, trust me, you're not gonna find them. Uh, they, they decay away almost instantaneously, and there haven't been any Higgs bosons floating around since shortly after the Big Bang. Um, so, so how are we going to do it? Um, well, I have you to thank, actually, because for every $1,000 of taxpayer money that you've uh, given, about 20 cents goes into funding this kind of research. And that's how it's been uh, for countries around the world. About 40 countries around the world have built the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest ex science experiment in the history of science. It's a ring about 17 miles around, just outside of Geneva, Switzerland. That laboratory is called CERN. Um, and underground, there is this big tunnel, and then there are enormous caverns that house big particle detectors. Okay, so this one is the Atlas detector. It's the one that I work on, and it's huge. It's the size of like a, you know, 11 story building, and every nook and cranny is filled with electronics, okay? So here, normally you don't get to walk on it, but we make you know, special, special exceptions for Ted. So, okay. Um, so, um, 
see here. So here's a picture of the atlas detector while it was still being constructed. You get some feel for just how big it is with this person setting the scale there. And on the other side of the ring is our competitor, the CMS collaboration uh, of, sorry, uh, ironically, C stands for compact. Okay, it doesn't look very compact. Um, and then there's the accelerator itself. So this is the Large Hadron Collider, the accelerator component. And it's, this is the thing that's 17 miles long, and it's filled with superconducting uh, magnets that are just two degrees above absolute zero. And we need all of that to accelerate this little thin ribbon of protons that you can see these two little ribbons in the middle of that uh, accelerator. Those are protons that have as much energy as like a jumbo jet when it's flying. So there's a tremendous amount of energy squeezed into this ribbon thin uh, beam of particles. And they accelerate protons to essentially the speed of light. Okay, so here you go, we've got one coming from one side, one from the other, and they're going to collide in the middle of our big particle detector. And when they collide, there's so much energy that we can ignite the production of new particles. They're not just breaking apart, we're making new particles. And this is through Einstein's E equals MC squared. And so the detector you can think of is like a big digital camera, okay? And we are taking uh, photos 40 million times a second, okay? That is a tremendous amount of data. We are producing the biggest data set in the history of science. So how many collisions have we had so far? If, we're, if you do 40 million collisions a second for two years, you get about a quadrillion collisions, okay? And that's how many grains of sand it would take to fill up an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So a lot of collisions. Now, how many Higgs bosons did we expect to make? Roughly a few thousand. So let's say, imagine that the grains of sand on that hand are roughly a few thousand. Now, imagine painting them red and mixing them in the Olympic-sized swimming pool. Our job is to go through and find those few red grains of sand. And it's an enormous data mining problem, and uh, that's, what, that's our challenge, and that's exactly what we did. So here is one of those collisions. Uh, at the, uh, there's particles flying out and et cetera, but at the top, you can see a little splash of yellow. It's a little splash of energy. And at the bottom, another little splash of yellow and when we look at them in detail, that's the bottom right inset, they look like you would expect uh, uh, from a photon hitting our detector. Okay, so some particle hitting our detector. And this is a candidate for the Higgs boson. This is one of the candidates that we have. Now there's another one. The Higgs boson was created in the middle. It decayed almost immediately, and in this case, into four particles called muons. Okay, these particles can travel all the way through our building size detector without being stopped, but they leave a trace on the way, and we can detect that, and when we look at that, this is another candidate for the Higgs. So when we saw these, we were very excited. Uh, <laughs> so naturally, but we didn't just you know, start yelling. We did a very slow, careful statistical analysis of what was going on, and on July 4th of 2012, we announced to the world the discovery of this new particle. So the next morning, I saw this on the newsstand. I bought about 40 of them. Um, I was you know, very excited. I, I, I love to read even. It says, physicists find elusive particles seen as key to the universe. And I think that sounds great because uh, one, they avoided God particle, and two, this particle is key to the universe. If it didn't exist, atoms wouldn't form. There would be no life. There would be no stars. I mean, this thing is definitely an important key to how the universe works. So I want to back up one uh, a quick step and talk about the statistical analysis a little bit. This is big science. We have thousands of collaborators all around the world looking for this particle, and there are lots of ways that you can look for it, and we somehow need to bring all of this expertise and all of this work together into one coherent scientific statistical analysis of what we're doing. And so the top, you see all sorts of plots from the data that we have, and you can see, imagine each of those plots is representing the work of about 50 people, okay, somewhere in the world. Now we need to bring all of that together and this big crazy looking web is, the, is an exact representation of the statistical model we use to claim the discovery. And at the bottom of this thing is where the data goes in and it propagates through and at the very, very top is the probability of the data given the theory. And what's nice about this is that it's not specific to particle physics. This is a technology we developed for doing collaborative science and applies to all sciences. So I think that this is something I'm very excited about that might have some you know, profound impact to how we do science. And it remind, this web reminds me of another web, uh, the World Wide Web that was invented at CERN by Tim Berners-Lee to help physicists communicate with each other. That, I mean, I don't know if you knew that, but the World Wide Web was, was invented at CERN and given to the world for free. So it's not a bad return on that 20 cent investment, I would say. Um, 
And it's definitely changed the world. So now let me just end with the kind of looking back outward in this cosmic connection. Okay, so here's this Hubble Space Telescope looking back into, into space. You see all of the galaxies out there. The, as the galaxies are farther and farther away, it takes a long time for the light to get, come to us, so it's also like looking back in time, like looking back towards the beginning of the universe and at the time of the Big Bang. But, but telescopes can only go so far. At some point, they hit a wall called the cosmic microwave background radiation, and that wall is the time where the universe became opaque. And at this very hot, dense state of the universe, we would like to know what was going on. And that's exactly what we're studying at the LHC. So here you see on the right uh, the, the Atlas detector. That gives you some scale for the energies that we're probing. So we've just seen two forces unify. We've just discovered the Higgs boson, really a triumph of human curiosity. Now we're looking for things like dark matter. We're looking for things like supersymmetry, and we're continuing our quest to understand what the universe is made out of, and I think that's something we can all take part in because, after all, we are all amateur particle physicists. Thank you very much.